Hi, I'm Vanessa from SpeakEnglishWithVanessa.com. Are you ready to expand your vocabulary with pictures? Let's do it. The more words you know, the easier it will be to express yourself and feel like yourself in English. So today I have a special treat for you. I've prepared over 70 pictures in 10 different categories so that you can really express yourself in different areas in life. It's really important to be able to look around you and talk about what you see in English. So I hope that these vocabulary words that you learned today will help to enrich in the words that you can say and also the words that you can understand. We're gonna be taking a look at these pictures together. You're gonna to see me small in the corner while we talk about emotions, textures, housing, weather, all of these different categories, and I'm gonna share some useful expressions for each category with you. And you're gonna be able to look at the picture visually and know what I'm talking about. So I hope that it will help you to connect the word and also what you're seeing. All right, let's get started with the first category, which is actually our biggest category. There are the most words for this one, and it's personality. Let's get started. All right, let's start with the first picture for the category of personality. We're gonna be going through all of these pictures pretty quickly because there's a lot to say, so feel free to write down in a notebook any new words that you hear. When I look at this picture, I see everyone is not smiling, and because their arms are crossed, because the way that they're standing, they seem snobby, stuck up maybe too cool. Sometimes we use the full expression, too cool for school. It's just a slang expression that means you think that you are better than the situation. I am too cool to smile in this picture. <laughs> These people don't look like really friendly folks, so we could use those expressions snobby, stuck up, too cool. This is Napoleon Bonaparte. Of course, it's not the real Napoleon, but it's someone who's play acting him. If we are to talk about Napoleon's personality, we might say that he was bold, brash, sensitive to criticism, and a way that we can say that in one word is touchy. If someone corrected him, I imagine that he might be a little bit upset, maybe a little bit angry. We could say that he was touchy. He was sensitive to criticism. If you've ever seen Star Wars, you know who these two people are. This is, I guess they're not really people. <laughs> this is Chewie or Chewbacca, and he is a loyal friend to Han Solo, who is the other guy. For Chewbacca, we could say that, first of all, he's loyal, but also we can use the expression a softy. He is a softy. That means that on the outside, he looks kind of scary, but on the inside, really, he's just a nice guy. <laughs> he's a softy. Now, as for Han Solo, if you've seen these movies, you know that he is also, like Napoleon, bold and brash, but also he's a bit of a scoundrel. Scoundrel is someone who doesn't follow the rules. Maybe they don't really care what other people think. They just want to kind of be risky or just do something for money, do something for adventures. So he's also pretty adventurous, but even though he's a scoundrel, he's the scoundrel we all want to be, right? A final expression we can use to describe Han Solo is cocky. Cocky means someone who is certain that they will succeed even though they might not succeed. It's kind of overly confident. <laughs> and in this situation, in this these movies, Han Solo is often cocky. Of course I can do it. Of course I'm the best guy for this project. This is overly confident or cocky. <laughs> Here you see the three famous friends from the Harry Potter book series and movie series, Hermione, Ron, and Harry. Let's start with Hermione, who is the girl. Hermione, at least at the beginning of the series, she is a smarty pants. <laughs> this means that she is smart, but she also wants everyone to know that she's smart. This isn't really a popular characteristic. Usually people don't like other people who are smarty pants. If you're smart, that's great, but just don't be a smarty pants. At the beginning, she is also a know-it-all. This has a similar meaning that she thinks she knows it all, and maybe she does. She does know a lot. She knows a lot more than the other people her age, especially school-related knowledge, but it's not a very popular characteristic. So you don't want someone to say, you are a know-it-all. 
kind of negative. We can also say that she is a goody two shoes. This is kind of a weird idiom, but it means that she's a rule follower and she's not willing to really go outside of the rules. She's worried about getting in trouble. She's a goody two shoes. She always follows the rules. Of course, if you have read the books or watched the movies, you know that her character evolves and changes throughout the different books. So she's not like that throughout the whole series, but this picture is from the beginning of the series and that's kind of how she's portrayed. Our second character, Ron, the guy in the middle, we can see from the look on his face that he is definitely a worry wart, or we could just say a worrier. He worries about a lot of things. He worries that he's gonna get in trouble, that his friends are gonna get hurt. He's worried that he's gonna get kicked out of school. He's worried about a lot of things. So even though he's not naturally bold, he often tries to be bold because he's a loyal friend, <laughs> but he is a worrier. As for Harry, the hero of the story, he is certainly considered brave, but also I feel like he has a strong sense of duty. When he was a small child, he had kind of his destiny created for him. He didn't really have a choice about what he was going to do in his life. I imagine pretty much everyone knows the story of Harry Potter at this point, but I don't wanna spoil it too much. But we could say he has a sense of duty. He has something he needs to accomplish and he's going to do it. This is a strong sense of duty. Next, we have a picture of the famous couple, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. John Lennon is firstly famous because he was part of the group, The Beatles. So he is a charismatic person. When he speaks and when he does things, others want to follow him. He's charismatic. Of course, he is also peace loving. He was wanting peace in the world. But at the same time, we can look at a negative side of that and say that he needs to be needed. So he really wants other people to need him. And in this way, it's kind of a cycle <laughs> because you, you want other people to follow your message, but you also need their approval. So in this way, he kind of needed to be needed. As for his partner, Yoko Ono, she was more of a utopian dreamer. <laughs> so she had some dreamy ideas, some maybe unrealistic ideas about peace and the earth, and we could say that she was a utopian dreamer. This isn't always a negative thing. It's not really grounded in reality, but it's just a way to talk about someone's personality. Next, we have two characters from the movie Titanic. If you have not seen this, then you should probably watch it to just understand something important from our culture in the last decade or two. But here, the female character, who is played by Kate Winslet, she is seen as someone who's ahead of her time. That means that other women during this time period just wanted to marry a rich guy. They didn't really have their own dreams and their own thoughts. At least they tried to hide those things if they had them. But for Kate's character, she wanted to really be herself. So in this way, we could say that she was ahead of her time. Ironically, she still ends up with a guy, maybe not some rich guy who all of her friends were also going for, but it's kind of still goes back to that stereotypical idea. We might also say that she was adventurous. She didn't care what other people thought. She was willing to just live on the edge. As for uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, Jack, he is seen as more someone who is optimistic. He has nothing to lose. He is a dreamer. He really doesn't think much about the future. He just went on the Titanic and, okay, I'm going to a new country. I don't know what's gonna happen. Let's see. He has no plan, but he's still hopeful that good things will happen, which is the characteristic of someone who's optimistic. Next, we have Martin Luther King Jr., or MLK. He was a famous leader during the civil rights movement in the US. And because he was the face of the movement, many people knew his face, they knew his speeches, he was, we could say, willing to put himself out there. This means that he was willing to take a risk, he was willing to get outside his comfort zone. In the end, he paid the ultimate price because he was assassinated. But in this situation, 
he wanted his message to be heard. So like Napoleon, like John Lennon, he was courageous, brave, and charismatic. He was determined that his message would get heard, but he was also, you know, willing to put himself out there. And our final picture for the category of personality is Forrest Gump. If you haven't seen this movie featuring Tom Hanks, stop everything, watch it right now, it is amazing. <laughs> but this character of Forrest Gump can be described as simple, straightforward. He says what he says, he means what he says, there's no confusing language about what he says. If he likes something, he says it, if he doesn't like it, he says he doesn't like it, so he's very straightforward in this way. We can also say he is naive. <laughs> naive is usually a character trait that we associate with children. This means that they're innocent, but also maybe they are in a difficult or risky situation and they think everything's gonna be fine, nothing bad will happen. In this movie, a lot of possibly bad things can happen to Forrest Gump, and he doesn't really feel fear. He feels like, okay, I'm just gonna do this. I'm just gonna give it a try and hopefully it will be okay. This is kind of a naive <laughs> sense, but everything good happens to him pretty much in the movie. He's a very lucky guy. <laughs> Our second category is emotions. You're gonna hear a lot of words that are synonyms. That means that they mean the exact same thing. There are different ways to describe the same feeling. In this picture, People are excited, overjoyed, ecstatic. Someone is getting married. I imagine it's probably the guy in the middle with his fist in the air. <laughs> and everyone here is having a great time. So we could use those three synonyms, excited, overjoyed, ecstatic, to describe this picture. In this picture, we see two ladies kindly listening to whatever this guy has to say. We could say that they are interested in what he has to say. They're curious about what he has to say. They're thoughtful. This means that they are thoughtfully listening. It's kind to listen when other people are speaking. So they are thoughtful people. On the other hand, we have these two people who look concerned, irritated, annoyed. All three of these things mean the same thing. Look at their face. Neither of them are smiling. Their brow is kind of furrowed. They're not talking together. Yes, their arms are touching, but they look like there's been some kind of problem. They're concerned, annoyed, irritated. In my opinion, these two kids seem carefree, relaxed, joyful. Make sure that when you're describing the emotions of kids, you don't say careless. Careless and carefree seem like they should have the same meaning, but children are carefree. They are free of any kind of worry. They're free of any kind of cares. Hopefully that would be the ideal childhood, right? But when you say careless, that means that you often forget something. Oh, she's so careless. She always leaves her notebook at home. She's careless. So these have quite different meanings, but in the situation, these kids seem carefree. Does this guy look happy to you? <laughs> Not really. He seems kind of either worried, bored, or maybe he's just somewhere else. When we say he is somewhere else, that means that his body is here, but his mind is thinking about something else. So if someone says, uh, wait, did you hear what I said? And you say, oh, I'm sorry, I was somewhere else. This probably means that you were thinking about another problem or what you're gonna do later, your mind wasn't here, it was somewhere else. This guy also looks like he's got some problems. <laughs> we could say he looks upset. He looks defeated. Maybe he thought something good was gonna happen and then it didn't, so he feels defeated. Or he might simply be frustrated. Oh, I can't believe this is happening, I feel frustrated. So he might be any of those three things. And our final picture in this category, emotions. These two guys look lost, confused, or baffled. 
<laughs> Baffled means they have no idea what's going on. They're lost. All of these things have similar meanings. Maybe they're trying to walk around a new city and they thought the bus was going to come and then it didn't come or maybe it just drove right by. Huh? What? Why did this happen? I feel baffled. I feel confused. Why did this happen? Our third category is textures. Or we could talk about the general feeling of something. It might not be the physical feeling, but I use the word texture to cover this whole category. Here you can see a clothing shop or a fabric shop. There are a lot of different textures here. So we might say, this looks soft. Or it looks flowy. Flowy means if the wind blows, then it will go up with the wind. We often use this to describe curtains. The curtains are flowy. The things you put in the window. Or maybe her dress is flowy. The bottom of it moves with the wind. Or we could say that something here is this kind of thick texture. Here, this blanket or maybe this wool blanket, they are thick. The texture is thick. It feels like it's something that would be useful in the winter time. In this room, we get the feeling that there are a lot of smooth textures. This couch doesn't have dog hair on it. It's not been ripped up. It's all one yellow color. It's smooth. We can also talk about the feeling of the room. We could say it feels airy because there's a lot of natural sunlight that's coming in and there's not a lot of heavy bookshelves or heavy furniture in the room. We could say it feels airy. And you could simply use the word clean to say this is an extremely clean room or there's clean lines. This bookshelf is pretty unique. There are some clean lines. The couch has some clean lines. It's the texture. When I look at this picture, I get kind of the opposite feeling as the previous picture. It's not smooth and airy. Instead, it looks scratchy, rough, abrasive. These different textures, especially here in his vest, that might be a scratchy wool. It might be abrasive. It might be rough. All of these different kinds of feelings and textures we're getting in this picture are the opposite of the previous one. It's not smooth and airy and light. No, instead it's a little bit rough and abrasive. In this picture, you see an art project. There's a pumpkin with some colored paint on it. <laughs> so we could say that it's bumpy. If you touched that paint, it would be bumpy. Or we could say the pumpkin has ridges, has ridges. I want you to know the difference between something that is rigid and something that has ridges. The pumpkin has ridges, but if something is rigid, R-I-G-I-D, that means that it's stiff. It doesn't move. When the deer saw the car, the deer became rigid. It didn't move. And also in this picture, because this is kind of like a paint or glue, as the paint is drying, you might say it's sticky. The texture is sticky. Here's another craft project. We could say it is metallic. The texture of these chains is metallic. Also, it's flat. The texture is flat because these buttons don't really have ridges like the pumpkin. Instead, it's pretty flat and it seems durable. These pieces don't seem breakable. So if this chain is taken off of this art project or these buttons are taken off, you can't easily break them. They're durable. That's the texture. Here we see a snail. <laughs> some people love snails, some people don't. I think they're pretty cool. I don't really want to hold them because they are sticky, slimy, gooey, or if we want to be a little more casual, you could say goopy. <laughs> you can use this for talking about food. You can use this for talking about snails, but it's that idea that it's sticky, slimy, gooey, or goopy. <laughs> For the first picture, talking about colors, let's take a look at this picture. We can see that the water is a beautiful aqua color, aqua. Or we could talk about the sand and say it is pure white. Yes, there's some variation here. Maybe it's a little tan. Maybe it's a little bit speckled with 
some shells, but overall it is a pure white. As for the sky, this is kind of a funny expression, but we often just say it's sky blue. <laughs> so to describe a blue, you could say it is a clear blue sky. Yes, of course, or it's pure blue sky, but the color of the sky can be described as it's sky blue. So you could say her shirt is sky blue. It's that light, beautiful, pure blue color. We can describe this bird by saying it's made of primary colors. Do you know what the three primary colors are? Red, yellow, and blue. <laughs> With these three colors, we can make all other colors, so they're called primary colors. This bird is made of primary colors. These kids have wonderful colors on. This boy's pants are maroon. This boy's shirt can be called, do you remember, sky blue? Or his pants can be called light blue. You might say his shirt is light blue too, but if we want to be a little bit more specific, we can say sky blue and light blue. And for her shirt, you could say bright pink, or depending on how you feel, you might even just say light pink. So you can see here we often use bright and light or dark to describe other colors. So you can use those adjectives with color and it will help you to expand your vocabulary. In this picture, their skirts are salmon pink. The color of the fish, salmon, we often use to describe color, salmon pink. Or we could say light blue for their shirts. And what about these shirts that are kind of a darker blue? We often call this royal blue. It's a really bright, vibrant color. It's beautiful. It's a royal blue. And for the yellow, we could say it's gold, or you could just simply say it's yellow. Here is a lovely table spread with different types of food. We can describe the color of this lobster by saying he is burnt red. This is when you burn food. Usually it becomes black, right? <laughs> but we often use burnt red to talk about this kind of dark, rich red color. Burnt red, or we could say rust red because it's the color of rust. What about this food, these mussels? I would just call them cream. It's a cream colored mussel. And funnily enough, these olives can be described as olive green. <laughs> If you have a shirt or if you have a wall or something else that's this color, you could say, it's an olive green shirt. Or, I forgot my coat, can you grab it? It's olive green, so that someone knows which coat to get. It's olive green. For the different types of brown, we often just say light brown and dark brown. So these walnuts are light brown and these Brazil nuts are dark brown. So we've got some different options here, but we can just use light and dark to describe them. In this famous painting, we can describe the red using a familiar word you just learned, burnt red. It's that kind of dark, rich, burnt color. Or in this situation, it almost looks like orange. So we could say orangey red or orangish red. So when you're trying to combine two colors like orange and red, we can either put a Y at the end of it or I-S-H. You could say bluish green or bluey green. Usually we say blueish, that's more common. Bluish green, we could say orangish green or orangish red, I guess for two similar colors, when you're trying to talk about something that's in the middle. For the green, I would call this, especially this darker green, forest green. The forest, the woods is this beautiful dark green color. But if you wanna be a little more descriptive than just dark green, you could say forest green. As for the yellow, I would say this is a pleasant shade of yellow. Pleasant is obviously a personal preference kind of word. Maybe you don't think it's pleasant. Maybe someone else thinks it is pleasant. But you can use this to describe any color. It's just a pleasant shade of red. It's just a pleasant shade of yellow. Just means in general, this is a pleasing color. Next, let's go on to our category of weather. In this picture, there's a lot of waves, but people are still enjoying the weather. So I would say it is sunny, warm, and windy. Simple words, 
But you know what? Sometimes we stick with those when we're describing things. Sunny, warm, and windy. The opposite of the previous picture, here there is a downpour. We might even say, it's a nasty day. This means it's not a day where you're going to go out for a walk. You're probably not even going to get an umbrella and a raincoat because it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. It's raining too much. It's a nasty day. Or if you look out the window and you see this, you might say, it's really coming down. It's really coming down. What is it? The rain. <laughs> and when you say, oh, it's really coming down out there, I think I'm going to need to drive to work instead of riding my bike. That means it's raining a lot. Another type of weather that you wouldn't really want to take a walk in, <laughs> I would say this is gloomy weather. It could be the middle of the day. I don't know. It looks so dark, though, that it feels gloomy because there's dark clouds. We might also say simply that there's a thunderstorm. <laughs> it's also lightning, but we often just say thunderstorm. We don't really say there's a lightning storm because usually thunder goes with lightning, so we just say it's a thunderstorm. Or if you don't see the lightning yet, you only see the dark clouds, you can say it looks threatening. Threatening. Who is threatening? you in this situation. It's really just the sky looks like it is probably going to have terrible weather. So if you're hiking and some big dark clouds come in, you might say, it looks threatening. We need to go home. We can't go up this mountain because it looks too threatening. This looks like a lovely fall day to me. It is cool, crisp, and partially cloudy. There's a lot of blue sky, but it's also cloudy too. When we say that a day is crisp, if you live somewhere that has four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall, then you have experienced this crisp, usually dry, beautiful feeling of fall. If you live somewhere that doesn't have four seasons, then that might be kind of a new sensation to you, having a cool, crisp fall day. This picture is not partially cloudy. Instead, because we're looking at a city, I would say it's smoggy. You might say it's foggy. Foggy is from natural occurrences because the wet, the air is, you know, cooler or warmer. But really, if this is created because of pollution, then you can say it's smoggy. Or you might use not just one word, but you could use the phrase, the air is thick. That means when you go outside, it's not really that the air is tangible, that you can touch it and it's thick, but instead it just kind of feels like that. Ugh, the air, there's so much in the air that it feels like it's thick. Unfortunately, this winter, this did not happen to my city. <laughs> we had a really warm winter, but if this happened to you or if you visited somewhere that had a, uh, a really big snowstorm like this, you could say it's bitterly cold. If it's more than cold and you're wrapped up and you're really hurrying to your next destination, it is not a pleasant type of cold. You could say it's bitterly cold. I imagine that this picture is also in the dead of winter. So you might say it's the dead of winter. That means the middle of winter. You've passed half of winter, but you still have half of winter to go. So it's the dead of winter. Let's go to our sixth category, which is nature. <laughs> Here we have a, a really beautiful scene. I would love to visit this spot. We can call it a rocky outcrop. That means that rocks are coming out of the water and it, it's kind of an island. You could say it's a peninsula connected to the mainland. It looks like maybe it's connected at the bottom a little bit. It's kind of a peninsula. Or you could just say it's a rocky outcrop. That means it's small, it's mostly made of rocks, and it's in the water. Also around this rocky outcrop, as usual for most rocky outcrops, there are cliffs. Straight down, not safe, <laughs> stay away from them. There are cliffs all around this rocky outcrop. In this picture, we can see snow-peaked mountains in the distance. Down at the bottom, there's not snow, but at the top, at the peak, there is snow. So we can say there are snow-peaked mountains. And in the foreground, in the front of this picture, 
we can say there's an evergreen forest. So it's something that is green throughout the year. During the winter, it's green. During the summer, it's green. It's a beautiful evergreen forest. I would love to go here. Looks like some people are riding their horses. <sighs> Seems like paradise, right? <laughs> this is a treeless, rocky mountain ridge. The ridge is the top part and it's treeless. There's no trees, maybe because of the elevation, maybe because of some other things that happened, but it's a treeless, rocky mountain ridge. We can also say there are mountains as far as you can see. You look into the distance and all you see are mountains. <laughs> so as far as you can see, there are mountains. Another wonderful destination, you can see another rocky outcrop <laughs> or just some rocks or a rocky formation coming out of the water. And we can say there is a chair on the beach. This is the beach. I know there's a lot of different words to describe the beach, the shore, the coast, but they all have slightly different meanings. So here, the chair is on the beach. If we said the chair is on the shore, we don't really use this that much in American English. The shore is often the place where the water comes up. So directly where there's water, that's the shore. And here, the beach is the sandy area. We use this to describe the place in general. I'm going to the beach. Maybe you're just going to the general area where there is the ocean and the sand. Maybe you're not really gonna sit on the sand. Maybe you're just gonna go shopping, but you might call that whole area the beach. I'm going to the beach. Here is a lush jungle. Lush means thick. It's hard to see through. You don't know what's there. It is a lush jungle. This house also seems to be isolated. So you might live somewhere that's isolated. You might go somewhere that's isolated. You could even feel isolated away from other people. But we can say here that this is an isolated location in the jungle. If you've ever been in the jungle, you know that they are usually humid. <laughs> This is not a dry place. Because it's lush, we imagine there's lots of moisture in the air, which is called humidity. So you could say, I had a great vacation. It was so humid though. We went to an isolated cabin in the lush jungle, but it was so humid that I had a hard time going outside of the air conditioning for a long time. I'm not used to this type of weather. It was humid. On the other hand, we have an arid landscape. This is extremely dry. We could say it's in need of water. You might simply say, I'm in need of water. <laughs> I'm really thirsty. I'm in need of water. This tree looks like it's in need of water. The land is in need of water because it's an arid landscape. All of these plants, I hope, are probably local plants. So they're used to living in this extremely dry desert type of climate, but occasionally they do need water. When I see this picture, my first feeling is, wow, this is powerful mother nature. This volcano, no one can stop. Hopefully you can predict a little bit, but mother nature, which is what we use to describe nature in general sometimes, is powerful. It is an unstoppable force. We can also see some lights at the bottom, and that tells me that there are humans living here. So we might say the volcano, it is a looming volcano or it is looming over the village. This has a kind of dangerous sense, like it's threatening the villagers, it's threatening the people. We don't know when it's gonna explode. It is looming over the village. You could use this to describe people too, like oh, the teacher is always looming over us. We don't use it for people as much, <laughs> but we can use it in that same dangerous, ominous, threatening sense. For our seventh category, we're gonna be talking about cities and how to describe different aspects of a city. This is the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was born. I spent just a couple years at the beginning of my life here, but I have a lot of family who still lives there. And we could say we're looking at the skyline. This means the overall view of the city from up on a hill usually, or maybe in a tower, you can see the skyline. This city is also built on a river. In fact, this city is built on three rivers, but most big cities are built on a river. 
It's just practical, especially a long time ago. They needed rivers for industry, for survival. So a lot of cities are built on a river or built on several rivers. Because there are rivers, we need bridges to cross the rivers. So we can say there are a lot of bridges that span the river. They go across the river, or we can use one word and simply say the bridges span the river. This is a lovely outdoor cafe on the corner. <laughs> it seems like a busy area. There's a lot of people walking around. And because it's a busy area, it's a good place to people watch. Have you ever been people watching before? It's kind of like bird watching, but you just watch people walk by. And if you've never done this, it's pretty fun. It's not rude or intrusive, especially if you're somewhere like this that's really public. You're just sitting back enjoying a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and you're just watching people walk by, enjoying being part of the city. You are people watching. It's not pretty, but there are parts like this in every city. We can call this an alley, or we could say it's an alleyway. It's like a small street between houses or between buildings. And usually you probably don't want to walk there at night because we can say it's sketchy. <laughs> or it's a little risky. Because there's a lot of trash here, I imagine that this is just, you know, a place where all of the trash bins are, but we could also say it's grungy. Or if we're to describe the whole area of town, maybe that whole area is a little bit full of trash, it's not very well taken care of, we could say it's a grungy side of town. So it's kind of a polite way to say, kind of a dirty, dangerous area, but you could just say grungy. This is a typical view in a suburb of the US, so we could say it's a suburban setting. These houses don't have much land, they're side by side, so sometimes when you're trying to buy a house or when you're talking about housing, you might say the houses are built on a postage stamp. A postage stamp is what you put on a letter when you send it in the mail, and that's really small, right? It has to be like this big, <laughs> and it goes on your envelope. But when you say a house is built on a postage stamp, it means that the land is extremely small and they're close together. Usually it's seen as a negative thing when you use that expression, but it could just be a way to describe the area of town. Yeah, that area is really close to town. Land is expensive. All of the houses are built on a postage stamp. Also, you can see some cars parked on the street. There aren't, I don't really see, maybe there's one, garages or driveways where people can park. So we call this just street parking. There is street parking where I live, so I always have to look for a spot. Or maybe if you're trying to go to a local restaurant and there's no parking lot nearby, you might tell your friends, hey, there's only street parking, so try to arrive early because you're going to have to look around for parking. It's a little tough to find a spot because there's only street parking. Here you can see a lovely night skyline. I believe this is Tokyo, a night skyline. This is an urban setting. So the previous picture was suburban, <laughs> and that means somewhere where people live, it's mainly residential, but here we have an urban setting that is a bustling metropolis. <laughs> we often use the adjective bustling, which means extremely busy. There's lots of movement to describe cities, busy cities. It's a bustling metropolis. Metropolis is a huge city. I would not at all <laughs> describe the city where I live as a metropolis. It is just just a city, maybe even a town, <laughs> but Tokyo is certainly a metropolis. It's huge, it's bustling, there's a lot going on. For our eighth category, food, there are really endless words we can use to describe food, so this is just a limited view of a couple of those. But here we have a wonderful scene. I want this scene to be in front of me every day. Well, maybe that would be a little dangerous <laughs> for my health. But we can say, here are some sweets. Here are some breads. Here are some pastries, probably in a bakery. So there's a lot of different words we can use to describe sweet bread foods. Sweets, breads, pastries from a bakery. Before those pastries are finished, this has to happen. So here are some bakers, 
And they are letting the dough, which is the uncooked bread, they're letting the dough rise, important thing. They are kneading the dough, which means kind of like pounding it and smushing it, kneading the dough. And because this is not just for their house, for their family, this is for a bakery, for a shop, they are making it in bulk. In bulk means a large quantity. There are a lot of different loaves of bread <laughs> that are being made, so they're making it in bulk. We often use this expression when you go to the grocery store and instead of buying rice in a bag, you can go to the bulk section and there's some big containers and you bring your own bag or they have some paper bags available and you pull a little handle and you can get as much rice as you want. So there's some alternatives, pre-bagged or in bulk. And that's what they're doing, they're baking bread in bulk. Have you ever eaten bugs before? <laughs> I have one time, but I've never eaten crickets. Um, this, These could be described as crunchy, <laughs> possibly spicy, unusual, but we can also say that it's an adventurous food. So you might say, I'm an adventurous eater, talking about your own self, your own type of taste. I'm an adventurous eater. Sure, I like to try adventurous foods. These are foods that don't seem normal to a lot of people, so you're going to get out of your comfort zone and try them. This meat, I imagine some kind of steak, is sizzling. It is grilled. Sizzling is the sound that you hear. Grilled is what's happening. <laughs> it is being grilled on this type of grill. And because there is red inside of it, it's not bleeding, but it's pretty red still. We can say it's medium rare. So we've got a lot of different categories for meat. We could say it's rare, which is very, very, very red. <laughs> basically raw. <laughs> Maybe the outside is seared a little bit, briefly cooked. Then there's medium rare, medium, medium well, and also well done. So there's different ways that you can have food cooked. If you go to a restaurant, what I usually do when I'm ordering some kind of meat, I ask the server, what's recommended? If they ask, how would you like your steak cooked? Well, if it's lamb or some kind of unusual meat that you haven't had before or you haven't had often, you could ask them, what do you recommend? What does the chef recommend? And usually I say, okay, <laughs> to whatever they say for it because I don't want the meat to be too cooked or undercooked. So there's important ways that we can have the meat and enjoy it at the same time. This stew looks spicy. It looks hearty and filling. Those two words mean the same thing, hearty and filling. We do not say a salad is hearty. A salad is usually light. It is not hearty. Hearty means lots of meat, probably lots of carbs like potatoes or rice or bread. It is hearty and filling. That means your stomach feels full when you're done. So it is hearty and filling. This also looks pretty spicy for a stew. What a lovely scene, a towering pile of fruit. <laughs> or we could say they look sweet. Some of these are sour and it's probably local fruit. In the US, we don't really have scenes like this with a lot of variety all together in a market. So I imagine this is probably somewhere where all of these fruits are grown locally. So we could say it's local fruit, or we could just use that for food in general. This is local food. It comes from a destination or a farm that's close by the city where I live. It's local. These guys are doing food prep. The word prep is short for preparation, but we often just say prep when we're talking about food. You might say, I need to prep the meat before I cook it. Maybe you're gonna season it. Maybe you're gonna marinate it for a while. I need to prep the meat. You could say I need to prepare the meat, but it sounds a little more serious. <laughs> Usually for cooking, we just say, I'm gonna prep the ingredients in the morning. That way, when I come home from work, all I have to do is throw it in the bowl and I can cook it. So I need to prep the food. So they are doing food prep. This is also, I think this looks like 
a soup kitchen to me. A soup kitchen is, they don't always serve soup, <laughs> but a soup kitchen is a place that gives food to people who don't have food. Maybe homeless people, maybe people who are poor, people who need food. A soup kitchen provides food to people in need. So if you want to volunteer, when if you live in the U.S. and you want to volunteer somewhere, you might look for a local soup kitchen where you can volunteer. Or if you need food, you can look for a local soup kitchen and you can go there and you can eat the food usually completely for free because this is a charity type of work. Uh, we can also see this guy. <laughs> he is cutting these onions very into very small pieces. <laughs> so this is called dicing. There's a lot of words to talk about different cuts, <laughs> but when you cut something really small, you are dicing it. Also in the this bowl, they are seasoning the meat. They are seasoning, they're dicing, they're pouring the oil in, they're probably gonna saute it I could talk for 10 hours about the different types of specific cooking expressions like this. Maybe I'll make that in another video. Let me know if you'd like a video about that. <laughs> but that's what's happening in this video, in this picture. For our ninth category, housing, we see a picture here of some apartments or some buildings that are close together. We can also say they are within shouting distance. <laughs> that means that if you shout, hey neighbor, that neighbor can hear you because your window to the next window, it's not a very big space. You can even use that expression within shouting distance for someone who's close to you in the grocery store. Maybe, or maybe if they're on the other side of the grocery store, you might say, yeah, I saw you in the grocery store last week, but you weren't within shouting distance. So I didn't say hi. I didn't want to yell, hey, because you weren't within shouting distance. That's not a specific measurement, of course, <laughs> but it's just that idea. We can also see a clothesline. Notice the pronunciation for this word is very similar to just close the door, a clothesline. In fact, there are many clotheslines <laughs> between the houses here. I would call this a side street. So I know we already talked a little bit about cities and alleys and alleyways, but here it's a side street. This is not the main street, but you could say, oh yeah, I live on a side street within shouting distance to all my neighbors. There's not much privacy. And this is a fun bird's eye view of the suburbs. A lot of these houses look the same. <laughs> they look like they were probably built within the last 50 years, maybe less. <laughs> so we could say it's a bird's eye view. You're looking down like a bird bird's eye view of the suburbs. This is outside the city, or we could say it's far from town. This isn't really a rural housing community. There's too many houses for this to be rural, but instead it's just the suburbs. It's not in the middle of New York City. It's outside the city. Because a lot of these houses look the same, we often use the adjective cookie cutter. Have you ever used a cookie cutter before? When you make, for example, 50 cookies in the shape of a star, you will use a metal or plastic cookie cutter. Boop, boop, boop. Every single cookie will have the exact same shape because you used a cookie cutter. We use this as kind of a negative term to describe houses. The houses are all cookie cutter. They don't have any unique qualities. Every house looks almost the same. They are cookie cutter houses. Or you could say, it's just a cookie cutter neighborhood. I don't wanna live there. I wanna live somewhere that has more character, more history. Or maybe you like cookie cutter neighborhoods because it's predictable. So this is a word that's often used to describe houses. Here is a brick apartment building on a corner with some iron fire escapes. Those stairs on the outside are just in case there's a fire and you can't go inside the building to get out. You need to go outside, you can use the fire escape, but these ones are probably iron or metal on the outside, an iron fire escape on the corner in this old brick apartment building. Houses like this are kind of common in the south of the US, especially in historic areas of each city because these are colonial style houses. So if you go on a road trip, 
to the east, especially the east of the U.S., that's the oldest settled area by Europeans, you're going to see some colonial style houses. We can call them estates. Sometimes they are plantations. A plantation means that slaves used to work there in the past, so there's probably a lot of land, kind of like a farm. We could call them a mansion in the U.S. Some other countries, some of the languages have different definitions of the word mansion, but in English, a mansion is a big, amazing, beautiful house. <laughs> this is a mansion. This house is kind of a typical American suburb, suburban house. It's got a big front lawn, lots of grass. It's got a nice front porch. So this is a pretty nice house. <laughs> it's got a flag. It looks a little bit sterile. Sterile is not cookie cutter. The houses in this neighborhood probably all look a little bit different. But sterile means there's not many personal touches. So there's not a vegetable garden. There's not toys out front for the kids to play with. It just has a few plants, a couple trees, and lots of grass. So in this way, it's kind of a typical American suburban home. For our final category, our 10th category, actions. In this picture, we see people who are not paying attention. Instead, what's the opposite of paying attention? They are zoning out. <laughs> this might be just a look on your face where you are not focusing, or it could be that you're looking at your phone, you're looking at a book, you're just closing your eyes, you're listening to music. You are trying to block out everything around you. You are zoning out. Maybe you are distracted. <laughs> They're not paying attention to what's going on, but when you're on the subway, you know, it's not a big, big deal. You can just zone out. This picture makes me smile. <laughs> this guy is taking, we could even use the, the Spanish word siesta, taking a siesta, or in more casual terms, we could say he's taking a cat nap. <laughs> this is a short nap. He's taking a break. He's taking a cat nap. We can also say he is precariously resting on his motorcycle. Precarious means it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> he could fall off. He's not steady. So that's a wonderful adjective to use when something's not steady. It's precarious. Don't put your water glass at the edge of the counter. It's too precarious. It could fall off. Instead, put your water glass in the middle of the counter somewhere far from the edges. What a busy scene. There's a lot of action happening here. So we can say there is a lot of hustle and bustle <laughs> for popular public destinations like a train station or the middle of the city. We could say there's so much hustle and bustle. It just makes me feel overwhelmed. Or I love the feeling of the hustle and bustle of this city. So that's the action that's happening. We can also say a lot of people are coming and going. That means they are arriving and leaving. A lot of people are coming and going because there's so much to do here. There's a lot of hustle and bustle. In this picture, these guys are working out. You can say they are working out, they are exercising, but this trainer looks like she's pretty serious, right? <laughs> so we could say they are getting their butts kicked. <laughs> <laughs> that means that she is making them work so hard that at the end of the workout, at the end of the exercise, they're probably going to lay on the ground and go, oh, that was so hard. This was an intense exercise. So they could also say, she is kicking our butts. That means she's making us work really hard. <laughs> or you could just say, wow, they are getting their butts kicked. <laughs> They are having to do a lot of exercises because this trainer is really serious. On the other hand, these three people are taking a leisurely walk in the park. Leisurely means they don't have a destination. They don't need to be somewhere at a specific time. They are taking a leisurely walk in the park. We can also substitute the word walk and say stroll. They are taking a leisurely stroll in the park. Or you could just say they are strolling in the park, just having a nice time walking around, chatting, no agenda, nowhere to be, just enjoying the day. This is a similar picture, just a different setting. These people are going for a walk 
and they are also walking their dog. Because this dog is not equal with the humans, you can say, I'm walking the dog. You would never say, I'm walking my child. You could say, I'm walking my child to school. That's fine. You have a destination. But if you just say, I'm walking my child, feels like they're on a leash, kind of like a dog. <laughs> but you can definitely say this for dogs. I'm walking my dog. So they're going for a walk. They're walking their dog. What a sweet scene. They are cuddling, snuggling, and bonding. Bonding means they are creating an important, deep relationship. When you cuddle or snuggle with someone, you are bonding with them. This guy looks like he might be studying, he might be focusing, or he might simply be watching a YouTube video. We don't know. <laughs> but in this situation, we could use any of these actions, studying, focusing, or just watching a YouTube video. This girl is not impressed with the food. <laughs> We could even say, she is grossed out. This is a really casual way to say, she thinks the food is disgusting. <laughs> she is grossed out. And what is she physically doing here? We could say, she is spitting out the food. Blah, blah. She's just spitting it out. Blah, I don't like this. I'm going to spit it out. And finally, to finish this actions category and this extremely long vocabulary lesson, these guys are taking it easy. They are basking in the sun. Basking in the sun is not necessarily sunbathing, but they are basking in the sun. They are enjoying the warmth of the sun. They are swinging on a hammock. I hope you have a chance to swing in a hammock sometime because it is extremely relaxing. It's a wonderful thing to do at the beach, at your house, anywhere that you are, just swing in a hammock. How did you like this vocabulary expanding lesson with pictures? I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that a lot of these words were new for you. I recommend writing down the new words in a notebook, trying to make a sentence with them and integrating them into your daily conversations. Now I have a question for you. Write a comment in the comments below and answer, can you describe the colors and the textures around you in your room, wherever you are, Try to describe some of the colors, some of the textures that you see. I'm looking forward to reading your comments and also make sure that you read each other's comments to just review the things that we've learned. Thanks so much for learning English with me and I'll see you again next Friday for a new lesson here on my YouTube channel. Bye. The next step is to download my free ebook, Five Steps to Becoming a Confident English Speaker. You'll learn what you need to do to speak confidently and fluently. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more free lessons. Thanks so much. Bye.